Hi, and welcome to episode 22 of C3 Crystals, Cauldrons, and Cocktails. I'm Ren. And I'm River. And this week, we are collaborating with a fellow witch, Steph, from Witch Wednesdays. We recorded a fun episode about fair folk, so I hope that you enjoy. Welcome back to Witch Wednesdays. I'm Steph, and you are listening to episode 88, which is going to be sort of a deep dive on the fair folk. And I have guests here with me today, so I am going to let them take it away to introduce themselves and tell you where you can find them online. Hi, we are C3 Crystals, Cauldrons, and Cocktails. We are a witchy podcast, and you can find us anywhere on any social media platform, really, at C3 Witchy Podcast. And I am River and she is Ren because I don't yes. think we introduced ourselves. No, I did not. <laughs> I'm Ren Graves. So yes, I'm very excited to be here on Witch Wednesdays with Steph. So thank you so much for having us. Mm-hmm. Thank so you. excited to have you guys because we had a episode before about just a little bit about working with the Fae. And I think since then, the idea of working with the Fae has sort of blown up and it's become a really popular topic, but also one that's really misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And people see it as one of two ways, either that fairies are all like Tinkerbell and that's what you're going to get. And it's just going to be, you know, fairy dust and magic and all good things. Or the other way that it's something to be avoided at all costs because it's very dangerous. Right. And it's really in, in between those two things. So I am glad to have you guys here today to just chat a little bit more about what that is, because I think in our intro episode, we really just went over very basic information. Yes. Um, And I think people are still pretty confused about what it even means to be a Fae and what it means to work with them. So I'm glad to get your input on that as well, because I don't work with very many Fae in my practice. I have little brownies in my house, but other than that, it's not something that I personally you know, do that much in my practice. So I okay. think it's important to have, you know, the information from a lot of other people to also give their input and opinions on the topic. And I believe if they want to go and listen to that episode of yours, it was episode 29, I believe. Oh, 29. Thank you. You're welcome. So yes, <laughs> um, go listen to that. It's just a, a brief introduction. And like, like you said, we'll do a deep dive today. <laughs> do you want to start with history or... That Um, yes, let's start with history. I think that's really important. I do I do try to go um, in other episodes. I have you know history of holidays and history of the Sabbaths, and I I think it's important to know where all of these things came from and why, like what's the basis of what we believe today. So yes, history absolutely. I I agree. Ren and I are very into the history of all things witchcraft. It's fascinating to to find out where these things did come from. So I think in your episode twenty nine, you talked about it being an Irish. Uh, coming from the Irish history or the Celtic history? We did focus on Celtic Fae history in that episode. Yes. Yes. So I'm showing that in Ireland, it was they, one of the early races of conquerors was known as the Tuatha de Nanan. And I may not. I'm be, so impressed with that pronunciation. Because I, was, I have never been able to say that in my life. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's pronounced correctly, but that's how I've always pronounced it. I think it is. <laughs> and uh, they were considered to be mighty and powerful and it was believed that when the next wave of invaders arrived, that the Tuatha went underground. Yes. Yes. And, and that, yes, that is, um, I, I think when people talk about the Fae now, we do really revert to that Celtic tradition. And that when you have that phrase, fair folk, mm-hmm. um, that is really coming from the Celts. And there are fairy traditions all around the world. They sort of developed independently. So yes. there are, you know, French and German and Slavic, all those things are different Fae. But yes, that is the history of where the Fae started for the Celts. And I think a lot of um, witches who work with Fae believe in that sort of realm of where they came from. Like okay. the Celtic areas are very popular. Rin says that her um, audio is going in and out. And oh, um, no. she had wanted to talk about in early modern English, fairy, the F-A-E-R-I-E, means realm of the phase. And as back to the Celtic thing, 
this Lady Augusta Gregory in her book, Good Gods and Fighting Men, she quoted that it was in a mist that the Tuatha de Don and the people of the gods of Donna, or as some called them, the men of Dia or De, D-E-A, came through the air and the high air to Ireland, which I thought was really interesting. That's other cultures, like you said, have also talked about the Fae arriving from the sky or in air. And this was also supposed to have happened on Beltane. Yes. That yes. Is, yeah. We've definitely talked about the Fae in relation to Beltane, that being a very definitely. good holiday to try to work with them and connect with them. Because it's, I think it's so interesting that all of these different, you know, peoples and histories and cultures came up with the same idea of the Fae des- descending from the air completely independently of each other. Me too. That, that, that just fascinates me. Yes. It's like, it's like how pyramids were built completely independent of each other in yes. Egypt, in South America. It's just absolutely fascinating. I love history. Me too. Me too. <laughs> uh, the, in, in the Celtic legend and lore, the Fae are associated with magical underground caverns and springs. And it was believed that a traveler who went too far into one of these places might find himself actually in the fairy realm. Oh, and I don't know if you've ever talked about it before. Did you know that in parts of England and Britain, it was believed that if a baby was was ill, that and that it might not have been a human infant at all? Have you talked about changelings before? You probably I, have. We have not. We have not. But they would leave a baby that was sick out exposed on the hillside, hoping that the Fae would come and reclaim it. So a, a baby, parents of a new baby would keep their child safe from abduction by the Fae by using either a wreath of oak and ivy or iron, as you talked about before, or salt placed across the doorstep. And also the father's shirt might be draped over the cradle to keep the Fae from stealing a child, which was weird. Very oh, weird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that one. Mm-hmm. Oh, that is very interesting. What else do you have on, on uh, history? Uh, yes. So in general, in this history of, you know, where the Fae came from in sort of, you know, Celtic, Scottish origin, uh, Wales, they kind of all meld together into what we now know as the fairy Fae folk, especially in America, we tend to call all of those, you know, realm the same thing, but they actually are different. If you believe in the fully Celtic, Scottish, Wales background, um, fairy, fey folk, and then fair folk and fairy, depending on how it's spelled, mm-hmm. mean refer to completely different things. And for me, it's a little bit confusing to trace. So I am going to have linked. Um, there is someone on YouTube, YouTube, the channel is called Black Dragon Tavern. Okay. And he has a really great description video that I will link because he has all of this information passed down from generations that he has gathered all of this knowledge from his family for and all of that region um, of how the Fae are different depending on which one of those phrases that you use. And it depends Interesting. where they are, um, whether it's in Ireland, whether it's in Scotland, and it's very detailed. So I'm going to link that because I, uh, for me, I never really knew that. I always thought, you know, Celtic Fae and Fair right. Folk very all meant the same thing, but in those traditions there, they do believe them to be just ever so slightly different. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I, I show that in Western Europe, they are fairies, the good folk, the hidden people, or the little people. Whereas in Scandinavia and Germany, they're elves or nixies or kobolds. And in Persian history, they talk about the term peris, P-E-R-I-S, And they apparently took the form of beautiful female spirits, evil for the natural troubles that they caused, like drought and famine and other natural disasters, but kind in their guidance of souls towards paradise. And then the Arabic jinn, like we here in America associate the jinn closely to genies, but that was a little bit different in the Arabic culture as to what a jinn is, um, but that they are thought to be often invisible spirits that grant the wishes in fairy tales. And in India, the bongas, B-O-N-G-A-S, are are considered to be evil fairies. Yes. And there are, I think that's why there is so much confusion or mystery surrounding the fae is because of that idea of evil fairies. Right. And I agree. That, 
that world being so diverse. So I think in, in any of these cultures that we've talked about in any of this history, they, the Fae is much bigger than what modern pop culture would lead you to believe. Yes. Yes. And a lot of people have the fairy, like F A I R Y, like mm-hmm. traditional sense of like Tinkerbell is a fairy and that's what all fairies are. Mm-hmm. And um, that is definitely popularized by Disney, but that is not, there are Fae that look like that. Right. But uh, there are a lot of other creatures within the Fae realm. I think uh, the Fae encompasses gnomes, elves, trolls. There's the little brownies that live in my house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and a lot of people also consider dragons and mermaids to be of the Fae realm rather than mythological creatures. They consider this all Fae realm. So there's a wide variety and wide diversity in what kind of Fae you could possibly work with. Yes, definitely. And I know that in your episode 29, Tara was talking about how they're tricksters. So it it can be scary to work with them. Uh, But I think we'll get into later as to how you can maybe work with them. But Ren had come up with some descriptions. Ren, is is your sound back? Um, I think so. It keeps going in and out a bit. <laughs> okay. We're happy to hear from you, Ren. <laughs> so you were going to talk about different variations of how they ha- have been said to look. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it went out a little bit there. But yeah, so their descriptions obviously vary. I find it really interesting like how different they can all look, but they are generally described as human slash humanoid. And they range in sizes. So I saw that they could be um, as tiny as a thumbtack to the size of a human. And in folklore, they have green eyes and are always barefoot and have wings. And actually what I found really interesting was the modern day illustrations of them. They often have dragonfly or butterfly wings instead of something different. Huh. Mm -hmm. And they're often seen with dragons too, in pictures that I've seen. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do think that there, because there's such a wide variety, I think that's why um, Tara was talking about the tricksters like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not that they're evil or tricksters on purpose. I think it's just, we are so focused on our human concepts of right and wrong or morality or ethics. And the Fae do not share our same worldview. I think that's a great mm-hmm. way to put it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. That they're not setting out to be tricksters or evil or they're, you know, stealing your sh- shiny jewelry to make you angry mm-hmm. and they, they don't think that they're stealing anything. It mm-hmm. was shiny and they pretty and they wanted it and they picked it up and for them there is no, you know, morality associated with that. So we're trying to put our human constructs onto their behavior and they just don't operate that way. So I think I think that's, that's why- a that's a great point that we're putting mm-hmm. our human view onto something that we don't necessarily understand. I think that's a really good point. I think it's very similar that, you know, we try to do that with animals. We um, do. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we, we put our human qualities on to them and that's just really not how, you know, nature reacts mm-hmm. and how it behaves because we are the only ones that sort of have that construct. So we can't put those same things things on the fae. So they're mm-hmm. not necessarily dangerous or evil or out to get you or trick you on purpose. You just think that because you're treating them like a human or maybe somewhere in like the toddler years, but that's not how they actually are. We don't, we, we don't know. None of us mm-hmm. are fae. We don't know exactly how they, that's think, right. But, um, that's right. It's the same with um, deities that when you're working with deities, they don't necessarily think the same way that we do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I agree. I, I found a little chart and Pauline Campanelli from Ancient Ways had a little chart of some of the the types of fae. She said fairies and elves, you can find them in forests, the fairy hill, fairy rings, fields, flower gardens, and they like to dance. They can see the future. They know the magical secrets of herbs, stones, and animals. 
whereas gnomes, trolls, and dwarves are often found in caves and mines, just like you would imagine, under bridges. They know the location of gems, metals, how to forge them. Brownies and kobolds are found in homes and cottages. They help protect the family. They do chores at night, which you had talked about how your brownies brownies do that. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. And they've been here longer than me. So they came out. (laughs) Yes. So how do you see them? Do you have any idea on how to actually physically see them? For me, there are a lot of different viewpoints on this and a lot of witches that I've talked to who have actually seen Faye and have developed their sort of senses to see them even more. And that is not ever something that I was blessed with. Like I have never been able to sort of see anything strange and that, you know, applies to not just Faye, but to ghosts or any sort of Mm -hmm. other sort of strange phenomenon. Um, Not one of the senses that I'm great at. So I'd never physically see anything. A lot of people will report, you know, wisps of light and, you know, floating orbs, or they, some people have actually seen, you know, what the fairy actually looks like. Hmm. Uh, But I never have. I just know that there are brownies in my house based on things being moved or missing or fixed that have not been done by me or my husband and my dog. And we're the only ones in here. So somebody (laughs) had to do it. And it wasn't the three of us. So do you know that they're here? (laughs) Do you feel them? Like I sense them? I do. I can mm-hmm. sense them, especially when I leave out offerings and sort of speak to them directly. The energy just feels a little bit different. It's mm-hmm. suddenly, it's like, um, it's a, almost like a cozy feeling. Mm. Neat. Like, okay. Yeah. Suddenly my home, because I usually do this at night and because brownies tend to work overnight mm-hmm. um, and I'll do this before bed. And like, suddenly it just kind of feels like the house settled. Like it's like a peaceful, like, okay, we're ready to, to you go to bed now and we're going to go going to get to work. So it's mm-hmm. kind of this peaceful, quiet, um, settling down, um, cozy feeling of home, which is, I like it. So I try to, you know, interact with them more to get that sort of cozy feeling. And I've been doing that more in the last year and it, they definitely respond to that. So that I, I do feel them. Yes. What, what do you leave for them? What kind of offerings? Is it the traditional milk or honey, that kind of thing? Yes. Little, little dishes of milk, um, milk usually, but honey I have done. And then little trinkets that I don't mind disappearing. Oh, neat! <laughs> they do like little tiny, shiny things, but I don't want them to like, take my jewelry. So I leave little shiny things that they can take instead. Well, I came up with some, I guess, mythology. I'm not sure if these things really work, but I was trying to find, you know, ways that people can see them because you always hear about getting the sight. And I read that it's believed that a wash of marigold water rubbed around the eyes can give mortals the ability to spot the fae. It's also believed that if you sit under a full moon in a grove that has trees of ash, oak, and thorn, the fae will appear. And then of course on Beltane, when that veil is thin, Nature comes alive, and that's when the spirits of nature are most active. So that might be a time that you can try to see them. And then I actually found a recipe, which was really cool, on uh, witchesofthecraft.com. And I can post a link to that. It's an actual spell. It's got rainwater and rose petals, lavender flowers, all kinds of things in there. And it's got a chant that works for this particular witch. But, you know, I, I don't, like you, I'm not, I don't have that. In innate skill. So I'm not sure that any of those things would help me, but I think it would help to know what you're looking for. You know, they're not all the Tinkerbells, like you said, you know, the mists, the balls of light, like you said, something moving out of the corner of your eye, the, the tween times, which is an, another uh, idea of when and how you can see the Fae is the, the time between night and day, like at dawn and dusk. Also, midnight, which is between one day and the next, on any solstice or equinox. Uh, Samhain is another time when the veil between the worlds is thin. So I I thought that all of those were fascinating. I've never tried any of those things. And then I found some things in fiction, like Spiderwick, 
uh, one of my, my oldest loved the spider wick series. And in that story, a stone with a natural hole in it could be used to see the fae four yes, leaf egg stones. Those are quite popular. Yes. Yes. And four leaf clovers are supposed to, to give someone the ability to see the fae, the seventh son of a seventh son. And then I also read having red hair. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, that's a good one. I know that it's just interesting. There was something I remember as a kid, and I don't know where I read this, that if you bent over and you look through your legs next to a railroad track and you looked into a cemetery, somehow that was supposed to give you the sight. And I don't know <laughs> where I read that or how I came across that. But I have not heard that one before. That's a good one. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah, Great. there's lots of interesting ways. And I don't know if that spell that uh, that other witch recommends works or would work on those of us that don't have that innate ability or not. I don't know. Yeah, that is, that is very interesting. I've never had that ability. I I feel like I'm skilled in, in other areas and I have different skills, but that's just not one that has ever come up for me. I have never noticed any sort of, but I'm also not particularly observant. So (laughs) even if there was a floating ball of light, I'm, I'm still not sure I would even notice it. I I think that's something that all humans deal with. We get so wrapped up in our day to day that we don't notice things that are right there. So it may be that there's things all around us. And that's part of, I think, magic is right there. But you've got to take the time to feel for it and connect to it and, you know, learn to look for it, which humans just don't take the time to do those things. No, we we really don't. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And that's. Part of the reason too why the Fae in general get such a bad rap is they have this idea that, you know, maybe they're terrifying, but they're no more terrifying than any other part of nature. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like a bear. If you respect the bear, the bear is not going to come attack you. That's and a we good have to point. have that that same sort of respect for the Fae. They're not there to, you know, amuse you or be your servant. You are supposed to treat them with the same level of respect. So if you are not respecting the Fae, if you're not respecting their habitat and nature, um, then maybe they are a more evil force towards mm-hmm. you. And I, I wouldn't blame them. And, and I don't know that it's evil per se, but like you said, they're they're looking at things differently. And if we aren't respectful, they might just think of themselves as protecting nature or protecting themselves from us, the evil. You know, we might be the evil ones to them. Yeah. I mean, I'm not particularly kind to people who are not respectful to me. Right. So I, right. I, I, I can absolutely see that from their point of view. So I think, yes, I think it's like any part, other part of nature. If you are respectful of it and uh, respectful of the power that it has, then it doesn't have to be such a, you know, terrifying presence. Yeah. Um, they are just another part of nature. And I think. Ren, if you're still there, you had come up with some ways to attract the Fae. Are you there? I think we've lost her again. It's got it's going in and out. I can hear y'all. It just hear keep, you. <laughs> it, it it just keeps going in and out where I can't hear y'all in certain chunks. So I don't know how to interject when I can't hear y'all. I'm oh, yeah. sorry. It's okay. I I want to talk more, but <laughs> I I don't want to like interrupt y'all or anything. And so I'm kind of just like listening to what I can. Well, why don't you, if if it works, try to tell us what you found about how to attract them. Um. Okay. So to attract fae or fairies, you have to acknowledge their presence. I, that's what I found is really important. You have to like, I guess to yourself inside, know that they're there and then acknowledge them. And then you can also provide offerings like we've talked about before, which could be milk or cream or honey. And even saying good morning actually helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What else do you have under attracting them? Planting. They thrive in nature, so it's a great way to attract them. So being out in the garden while watering your plants, you can also greet them. And it, I guess, I don't know what the word is that I'm looking for. Not complies, but it, it. makes them happy. Okay. Maybe maybe that's the word I'm going for that you acknowledge them and you're taking care of the environment and uh, making like even like a garden for them or having your garden be available to them at all times and that makes them happy. I have a an actual fairy garden that I did with my youngest. We 
you know, those little fairy gates and little fairy cottages that you can buy. And we actually made a little garden where we put hostas and all kinds of other plants out there um, with the fairy garden around it, which hopefully makes them happy. Mm -hmm. That sounds so cute. Yeah. And I have heard that they have favorite stones, the tiger's eye, the peridot, jade, and the emerald. I have heard that they are especially fond of, or any of the shinies that you've left for them, uh, Steph, any of those? Um, yes, they do. I, I like to leave only little chunks, little tiny pieces mm-hmm. of crystals if I if I have them, little chips. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I've definitely found that they are quartz family in general, uh, because they, the quartz tend to have like a nice sparkle to them in the sunlight. So I think that's why they're particularly attracted. It's got a nice sheen to them. Mm-hmm. Um, tiger's eye, definitely. I think tiger's eye is the, the color of nature. Maybe that's why. I agree. That's oh, a good point. Yeah. Those, yeah. yeah. You know, brown tones in there. And emerald too has got those green tones. So I think those nature colors really attract them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've heard that plants that are said to attract the fae are yarrow, aster, the shasta daisy, Thyme, rosemary, verbena, which I grew up calling those butterfly bushes. There's something called a cosmos flower, which for me, cosmo is a cosmopolitan. That's one of my favorite (laughs) drinks, but not so sure that the Fae would be super happy if I left them out of cosmo. Um, (laughs) They probably like mead though, because that's a honey drink. Um, But anyway, so plants are supposed to be a great way to attract them. And then I've got some information about how to tell if they're nearby. Is that something, Steph, that you want to hear? Oh, definitely. Okay. So you can tell if Faye is nearby if if you didn't plant anything outside, but you notice plants growing close to your home, like plants, plants sprouting from very unlikely places. So say you live in a really highly urbanized area that has no space for planting, Fairies will sometimes help plants grow in these urban areas to bring nature to places that humans have taken nature away from. Also, like you had said, steps, small and shiny objects can vanish, little pieces of jewelry. Uh, Sometimes those objects are quickly found. They might put them back. If you have pets, they might suddenly exhibit happy, energetic behavior, such as dancing, running, or playing. Sometimes that might be the fae playing with them. I've heard cats especially yes. are attracted to playing with Faye. Yes. I love that because I've always, I've grown up with animals and to think that like maybe their zoomies could have been like the Faye, like it's just a fun. chasing <laughs> them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Uh, if you notice your pet looking sideways or following invisible movements, it might be them. I would always say like, if I see like them looking sideways for like, at like something across the room, I'm like, my mind goes to, oh, it's a ghost at first. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Also at night during those tween times, like at sunset, you might hear strange small taps that you can't find the source of. Again, my mind goes to ghosts. (laughs) (laughs) And then birds are another way to tell if there are fae nearby. Sometimes they act non-bird-like, and that might mean that fairies are near your house. Also, you might notice that small articles of clothing and accessories go missing and then turn up in unexpected places in your house. I could say I have that happen a lot. I'm not sure if it's just me misplacing things because I tend to lose like my wallet and my keys <laughs> like all the all the freaking time. But I could say that it's probably just me, but who knows? <laughs> and then they said the sudden scent of flowers and then fairy rings, which that's the ring of mushrooms. I, I love fairy rings. When I was with my daughter at the bus stop, there was a fairy ring there. And I asked the kids at the bus stop if they knew what it was and why it was there. And some of the kids burst into this scientific explanation about the fungus that comes from the mushrooms and all of that. And I said, well, do you think that maybe the fungus got on the feet of some fae who danced in a circle and scattered the fun- fungus? And that's why they became it became a a fairy ring. And they just had no idea what to think about that. Their their little minds, I think, exploded a little bit, which I think is good for kids. Kids sometimes in this time aren't given the the chance to think about the, the magic that's all around us. They're forced to, you know, study, 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 and, you know, that kind of thing. And so I, I, 
always take the opportunity when I can to help interject these little th- little tidbits into children's minds. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that they think they're forced to grow up a little too fast because children are supposed to be better at at seeing all of these things, mm-hmm. seeing you know, fae and ghosts and everything else that adults are like, well, either I can't see them or they don't exist, whichever, you know, side that you're on. Yeah. Um, I wonder children why. Children are like supposed yeah. to be able to see all of these things, but we force them to grow up quickly and tell them that they're crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's nice to encourage that. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I, I actually have a similar story to that river. When I was younger, my world was always magical as a kid. Like my mom always wanted to enforce like creativity and like properties of humans that might like, what am I trying to say? Like, are you there? We might've lost her. No, no. Oh, bless her heart. Oh no. Yeah. She's on her husband's computer. So hers isn't working. So she's trying to manipulate his computer. So that could be part of it. Lots okay, there we go. Oh, yeah. I think I'm back. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> I don't know exactly how far into that y'all heard. Just a, um, just a very little bit that you said okay. you had a similar experience when you were little. And your okay. Life yeah. was very magical. And then I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So my world was always magical because my mom wanted to enforce creativity on all of us and have our minds open to everything. So my mind was always curious and asking questions. And I even asked my mom why there were mushrooms in our front yawn, like lawn or yard. And she said it was the fairies. And I, like ever since then, it was just like my mind was all like, oh my gosh, like magic is real. And oh, that's, that's so nice to yeah. have encouragement like that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I think that's sweet. <laughs> yeah. That's all I had on on the different fairy things. Um, I've never worked with them, so I can't uh, speak to that. Rin, did you ever work with the Fae or do you have any tips on working with the Fae? I have not. I am still like relatively new to witchcraft. I, I won't say new because I've been practicing basically my whole life, but I haven't like gone into depth into anything. Mm-hmm. But when I look at stuff that comes to working with the Fae, I just want to say like, be, be cautious, do your research, be polite, protect yourself. And I, I like this. I read this somewhere in one of, in one of my notes, um, earlier, like a couple of years ago. And it says, act as if you're full, like it's a fully blown, like partnership or marriage, meaning like communicate. And it's a two-way street between you and the Fae and, and like understanding what they want versus what you want. And I, I really I, like that. I kind of <laughs> like that too. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think a lot of, you know, witches who have issues and have horror stories about this go into it with like a very one-way street mm-hmm. and I think witchcraft in general is whatever you decide to work with is not a one-way street whether that is deity work ancestors spirits mm-hmm. animals nothing is a one-way street you are n- not dominant over anything else I think humans have a tendency to think that we are dominant over everything and that is a huge problem I agree <laughs> I agree. So you're not dominant over the face. So the more of a, yeah, working partnership, but yeah, definitely like a marriage you have to communicate. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And I, I do think like anything else, it's important to be cautious. I just had an episode last month on health, safety, and protection in witchcraft, like a lot of various ways, but the Fae is one of those things where more knowledge is better and you cannot be over-prepared. So learn everything that you can, because you'd rather have the knowledge than not have it and get yourself into a situation that you can't get yourself out of. And and yeah. try to try to think in terms, you know, we tend to have a one, one track view of life. Try to open yourself up and look at things from other directions as well, because like we just said earlier, they don't think like we do. So try to look at every angle when you're working with magic and the Fae and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. One thing I wanted to mention to you listeners, because it's a question that I've seen pop up because people say the Fae and then immediately somebody jumps in with, you know, be careful of this, beware of this, right. there's all these strictures and problems. And then the person will respond, why does anybody even want to work with the Fae then? Mm-hmm. And I really wanted to address that of, of why would you want to work with the Fae at all? And I think the answer to that is the same reason as why would you want to work with spirits mm-hmm. or your ancestors or deities? Mm-hmm. And that is to learn about their lives 
you're never going to learn about this whole fae realm. And, you know, part of fae folklore is that we as humans used to be able to see them and exist side by side. And the more that we've sort of fallen into the path of humans sort of being destructive and not believing in those things and mm-hmm. thinking we're dominant, that world has been lost to us. And that's why we can't see it anymore. And we can't see them anymore, even though they're right there next to us. So now the only way to really wor- learn about their lives and that realm is to work directly with them. So that's one reason, just purely curiosity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, another reason is for assistance where we can't travel for any kind of spell work. And that is another reason that witches work with familiars and why they work with spirits and ancestors, because there are just some places that we can't go. Right. Um, And they can, and they can assist with, with all of those things. Mm -hmm. And Faye especially are great to work with for connection to the earth. Um, So if you are feeling very disconnected from earth and nature and grounding, which is more important than I think anybody gives credit for to connect with that. It's our world is so modern and fast paced that we are so disconnected um, from nature and from being grounded and slowing down. Um, so if that is you and you're struggling with that and it's really helpful to work with the Fae to connect with nature in general, like I mentioned my brownies, it's all of a sudden a, like a feeling of peace in my home and mm-hmm. relaxation. Cause they're just like this great grounding energy. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Mm-hmm. And, um, Fae are especially great for healing and empowerment. Most witches that I know that work with Faye um, have found it very empowering to work with them because they are very powerful creatures. Yes. No matter what their size is or what they look like, even if they are tiny little balls of light, they are very powerful, more powerful than we are. Right. So working with them can be a source of power and it can also be empowering. It's like working with a empowering deity, like, um, Hecate or the Morgan Morgan are very powerful mm-hmm. and empowering to women. And, and Faye are exactly like that. Thanks. Same okay. level of mm-hmm. empowerment. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And healing in general, Faye are great for healing. So if you are struggling with um, chronic illnesses, a lot of people like to turn to the Faye for that, um, for their healing powers. If you think of like Tinkerbell and her <laughs> flying fairy dust, I mean, you're mm-hmm. not going to fly, but it does have that sort of, you know, healing effect on you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So a lot of good reasons to work with the Fae. And it's just the same as working with any other entity in witchcraft. Um, you just have to know what you're getting into and know why you want to do it. But there are a lot of benefits and good sides to it as well. Yeah, I think the reason we hear so many bad things is that people haven't taken the time to understand what they're doing. So just be prepared. And, you know, they are a great resource. And I know I love the healing aspect of it because sometimes my soul feels wounded and I do feel disconnected from nature. So maybe I should start working with the Fae. I have never before, but you know, that's probably why people have bad stories is because they didn't respect them. They didn't research it. So just, you know, go use common sense. Yes. I think that's missing. And I don't know if it's because of the idea that we have of the Fae. Um, Maybe that was, been popularized in pop culture that we don't respect them enough because we think they're little, they're all little Tinkerbells. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, what happened when they disrespected Tinkerbell? Okay. It wasn't good there either. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. That's very true. <laughs> You'd think that we would learn, but we have not. No, you're right. And, and Tinkerbell was not evil. Tinkerbell was jealous and they treated her poorly. Mm-hmm. So I feel for her. Mm-hmm. Me so too. I, I think that's where, yes, a lot of this, you know, bad stories and dangerous ideas come from is people who did that just didn't have the proper level of respect. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, And as far as resources that I wanted to mention, I have these linked in the show notes at whichwednesdays.com if you want to check them out. But um, there is a YouTuber who I love and her name is Mint fairy, all one word and fairy is spelled F A E R Y. And she looks like a little fairy herself. I absolutely adore her. And she (laughs) works with the Fae and has so many videos on seeing the Fae and honing that site to try to see them, her personal encounters with the Fae. um, That's entirely what her practice is based around. So absolutely check her out. She is great. And Definitely. two books that I have read are A Complete Guide to Fairies and Magical Beings by Cassandra Eason and A Witch's Guide to Fairy Folk by Eden 
McCoy eating. I think that's, I'll have it spelled out so you can find it, but wonderful. Um, both of those books are really great resources on the history and the background and just getting you that knowledge that you need to feel comfortable to then go out and work with them. Mm-hmm. That is great. This was fun. <laughs> yes. I, I enjoy it you know, chatting with other witches who have these sort of same ideas in the Fae. And I know that a lot of these have come up as questions. I have gotten questions on Instagram or over on the um, discord community of just, why would you want to work with them? You know, we understand the, you know, precautions that you should take, but why and where did they come from? So it's nice to have other people who are interested in this topic as well to sort of do a deep dive on it. It's been a big request lately. Nice. Great. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you so much for being here. And again, if you want to tell my listeners where they can find you online. Ren? Um, yes. Uh, we are social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter at C3 Witchy Podcast. And you can also find us at www.c3witchypodcast.com. And I will have those linked over at witchwednesdays.com just to make it easier for you. And if you follow me on Instagram, I'll be tagging them in the post on, on this day, uh, as well. So you can find them. And if you have any questions to direct their way, they have lots of great episodes for you and content for you to listen to as well. So absolutely go check them out. And thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Steph. (laughs) And everyone else, I will see you next week. So we really enjoyed visiting with Steph on Witch Wednesdays. Be sure to check out her podcast. She's got lots of interesting topics and episodes. And of course, come back and listen to all of our episodes. Mm -hmm. You can find us on all our social medias at C3 Witchy Podcast. That's TikTok, (laughs) Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And the best place to contact us and see the latest information is to go to our website at c3witchypodcast.com. There you can email us, click the links to our episodes, find and buy our merch, and subscribe for our monthly newsletter. And one last thing, please click that Patreon button on our website and support us. It can be as little as $2 a month. Anything would help. It costs time Mm -hmm. and money. And while our husbands love us dearly, I'm not sure they're too thrilled with the money that we are spending on trying to bring this uh, podcast to you guys on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we'll be back. Thank you so much for listening. (laughs) Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.